Thank you all for coming out. How many people who are sitting here tonight have been here for any portion of the last three days of the activity before tonight? Oh, good. It looks like we have a lot of repeat visitors this evening. How, for how many is this your first time in here as a part of this uh, presentation set? Excellent. Okay. So for all of the uh, newcomers and the, and the ones who've been here a while, I want to give a little bit of an introduction. Uh, my name is George Proakis. I'm director of planning for the city of Somerville. Um, worked here in, the, in Mayor Curtitoni's administration for the last five years. I'm here with Brad Rawson, a senior planner who's worked here in the administration for a bit longer than me. And um, the two of us have been, really had the honor to participate in what we believe is a very unique um, neighborhood planning process whereby we have tried to uh, break down the doors and barriers that usually stand between designers and, and neighbors and try to allow the opportunity to um, to really work together to plan our future and see where we can end up. A um, little bit of background, Brad and I and a number of our colleagues um, had the opportunity um, between 2009 and 2012 to serve as part of the staff to the, to the steering committee that put together the Summer Vision Comprehensive Plan. And the Summer Vision Plan calls for 30,000 jobs, calls for 6,000 new housing units, calls for significant open space, um, as many trips as possible being walking, biking, transit, and also calls for 85% of our new development to be in areas we call transformative, areas like Assembly Square, Interbelt, Brick Bottom, the southern end of Union Square, Boynton Yards, and at the same time calls to conserve our residential neighborhoods to transform our neighborhood business districts like the core of Union Square, making them a better version of what they are today but not that radically different and kind of balance all of those things to focus on a plan that combines a plan for growth and a plan for neighborhood conservation. Um, we've been very focused on doing that. When Summer Vision was completed, it was a 60-person steering committee. A lot of residents, business owners, neighbors worked with us on that process. We did a ton of community meetings, um, brought it to the um, planning board that adopted it under state law as our official master plan. We brought it to the Board of Aldermen that endorsed it in April of 2012. Um, just after that, we started to look, like, look at how you implement Summer Vision in the neighborhoods. Um, and in addition to starting on a three-year process to look at our zoning ordinance, a separate conversation that's probably for a separate night, unless folks have a lot of questions about that. But essentially, we decided our real core issue was to get into neighborhoods and look at doing physical design-based neighborhood plans to talk about what we wanted the future of our neighborhoods to be. We started at the small Green Line stations, Gilman Square and Lowell Street. We have finished plans for those areas. We wrapped in the planning that was being done for Interbelt and Brick Bottom and kind of where those two transformative neighborhoods would go into, into our plan. But we brought the Somerville by design concept to East Somerville, to Davis Square, to Winter Hill, and now here to Union Square, where we started with hearing a vision, understanding where things are, trying to get the biggest crowds possible to come into the process, um, invite people to sit for a three-day planning event in the neighborhood, um, where we find a great spot in the neighborhood. We've borrowed everything from storefronts to now post offices, you know, whatever works, um, to have the opportunity to have people come in, drop in, give us your ideas, give us feedback on various topics that people picked through the vision session. And, um, and the idea of the charrette really is to very quickly generate a lot of ideas. Some of them may be good ideas, some of them may be bad ideas. Some of the ideas you'll see tonight we will later eliminate because no one likes them. Some of the ideas you will later see tonight, we will later eliminate because they are engineering marvels that cannot actually be done in the real world. I can't guarantee any of them is buildable tomorrow. What I can guarantee you is that all of them are great ideas that our team really loved putting forward to hear your reaction to, to understand if you think it works or if you think it doesn't work. And my goal tonight is to have the opportunity for us to be as, as open as possible to getting as much feedback as we can. The most valuable way you do that is through the feedback forms based upon the plans out there, um, but also through the opportunity to, to, to hear your concerns as, as, as we go. Uh, for the most part, most of this is structured to grab the feedback through the forms. We have a lot of people here tonight doing an open Q&A. could take essentially all night, but I certainly understand the the interest and the possibility to be able to have a few issues and questions answered. I want to um, um, have the opportunity to do that to the extent that I can, but really focus mainly on getting the feedback form information. We will be back here on Wednesday, May 13th with 
um, more information from your feedback and more, more responses. If there's stuff that needs follow-up before then, and there might be, we may schedule another meeting even before then, and if you've signed in and you're on our list, you will definitely find out about that. The idea is to generate ideas, put out ideas, get feedback on ideas, learn about where you're going, and generate new sets of ideas based on that. Um, before we dive into the formal presentation tonight, I have a question of all of you that I would like to ask. I, I know that we have worked tirelessly over the last couple of months to try to make sure that we can provide the most open and inclusive process to get as many people engaged in the program as we can. Um, this evening, I noticed there was a group of people holding signs and protesting out front. I was working with the, with the committee to, with the folks here to try to get the presentation together. I didn't really see exactly what, what concern was and what people were expressing concern about. If there's anybody from that group that would like to express your concerns, if you feel there's something we haven't done right or we haven't done outreach right on before we start our presentation, I would like to hear that. It would really help me make sure that as our team presents that we're being responsive to you and your concerns. So if there's anyone in that group who has something they'd like to say to us, I'm, I'm here to listen. I want to hear what you have to say. Okay, everyone, someone please, thank, thank you. Are they still outside? Okay. Yes, no, I, I, just, I just, feel free to. Okay, thank you. And, and thanks for stepping up and sharing your concern. I really appreciate that. Um, does anybody else have anything they'd like to share and focus on on that before we get our team started? Yes? city will make that and the developer and there's no place for the community. We want, to, we want space for the community. We want the community to be present in the city to be made. Okay. I, um, we certainly strive to do as much as we can to have as much community process and participation in so many of the things we do. Um, I am more an expert in the nuts and bolts of design than the nuts and bolts of community benefit agreements, but we will dive a little bit into that topic of discussion a little later in our presentation tonight. So I want to provide a little background into where we are and where we are going as it relates to Summer Vision and as it relates to our, our program. We have tried tonight to put together um, some ideas that would inform a neighborhood plan for all of Union Square. And um, there's a boundary on some of the maps you can see that basically is kind of a rough edge of what we think is, is the neighborhood of Union Square. But certainly it's not necessarily, I mean it blurs a little bit one way or the other. But the key is that the overall plan is it's not about the individual development blocks. We understand we have a master developer who is partnering with us on a series of blocks, blocks D1 through D7 in the program. Um, but it is really about the ability to um, get the uh, entire neighborhood plan together, including those blocks, including Boynton Yards. Um, when you look at the Summer Vision Plan, the Summer Vision Plan talks about the possibility of 30,000 jobs and 6,000 housing units in the city. Um, we'd have to do at least 4,800 or 5,000 of them in the general area of Union Square over the next 15 years. And I think if you look at where this neighborhood plan could go, it could really guide us the next 30. In Davis Square, they did a plan in 1984 that guided them for 30 years, and they implemented much of the pieces of that plan over the course of the 30 years that followed. Um, here, we want to build a consensus on how we can do that. And I think it's much like Summer Vision, it's, it's a lesson in how to match conservation with development in places where new development makes sense versus places where we want to make sure we preserve many elements of the character that exists there today and just do what we can to make that character better. So I've got a pretty, um, I, 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 I've, I've had a, a real 
opportunity with the honor to work together with this team that's here today. Um, mainly folks working with us from principal group, Russ Preston and his team, from Util, um, Tim Love and his team, um, a great design development group that has a great perspective that works for us in the city, that has done other plans with us, that is looking at our perspective and our neighborhood perspective, where, where all of us want to go. Um, in addition, we've had available to us uh, David Carrico from Carrico Illustration, who's probably the fastest person at drawing 3D drawings you will ever see, and he did some amazing renderings of just all sorts of different ideas that came up. We've had um, our team from, um, we've had some, we've had some assistance from the folks working with US2. We've had some assistance with Nelson Nygaard, a transportation team that we've worked with on some of our other neighborhood plans. Um, and we've had assistance from all of you who've had the opportunity to come in here. I know there were a couple of you who were sitting drawing plans at the tables today, a few who showed up with some of their own ideas. We posted them out there too. Um, we're trying to get all of these ideas going and into the presentation. So um, I also want to call out, I saw a couple of elected officials here tonight. I believe I saw Alderman Ballantyne from Ward 7. Um, um, Alderman Bob McWaters from Ward 3 is, okay, and, um, and Alderman Marion Houston from Ward 2, um, and uh, Alderman Mark Niedergang from Ward 5. And um, <laughs> is there anyone else I missed? It's such a crowd here tonight. All right, well, um, thank you so much for all being here. I'm gonna turn it over now to Russ Preston, who is going to give you a little bit of what we've learned about Union Square and what kind of perspective they're able to give. Remember, these are all just ideas, and the fun part is going out and filling out, oh, filling out the feedback forms, which give you the chance to tell us which ideas you like and which ones you don't, and that's part of, part of the whole experience. So uh, here you go, Russ. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out with us here tonight. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces, so some new faces. Uh, how many folks, is this their first meeting for, for this process? Okay, okay great. Um, how many people have come by the charrette this week already? Okay, so about half. All right, great. So this, just to kind of explain where we are in the process before I get going, um, this is a uh, a pinup. So what I'm going to do is narrate all of the ideas that we've that we've pinned up in the the room next door, and kind of give you the context and kind of lay out the 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 design thinking, the policy thinking, all the all the thoughts that have come together to create these ideas. And then after that, we'll have folks out in the pinup space available to to dive into as many details about ideas that you want. Um, and each of you will get a form to fill out, and we really want to get your feedback on each idea. Each idea is numbered. So there's a lot in here. You know, our team has been really burnt, you know, burning a lot of hours. We were here until almost midnight last night, a few of us. So it's, you know, they put a lot of work into this, trying to get every idea, everything we heard into this. But if we'd miss something, we want to know. So that's important that you let us know, uh, you know, in the, in the feedback afterwards. So, um, you know, George introduced our team already, so I'll just get right into it. But before, uh, you know, before diving into the ideas, so process, so we're here, we're right in the middle. Um, you know, this creates, um, you know, a really, we've tried to really create this as a collaborative process, you know, that's why we have designers in the same room as the meeting's happening. You know, a lot of discussion has occurred over the last few days, a lot of drawing, a lot of analysis. Um, so just, again, thank you for this, all this wouldn't be possible without the participation of the folks in this room and the community. But what this all creates is a neighborhood plan, and that's you know a guide for the future decisions that the community wants to make. So you can download these at the city's website for Lowell Street and Gilman Square, uh, and take a look at those. Now, um, Union Square is a, is a unique place. We all know that, and one of the major things we've heard from you from you all is what happens when development starts, and how do we get a community benefit created? So. This is our typical process in the other neighborhoods in the Somerville by Design process. So we're in the charrette, and the next thing that would happen would be an open house, where after we've gotten all your feedback, you know, and done some more analysis and some more design on it, we would draft, we, we'd come back to you and show that in, in May at a plan open house, get another round of feedback from you all on what, what you think of that, and then we'd, we'd draft the neighborhood plan. So 
that's our typical process, but in Union Square, after a lot of discussion the last couple days, we're going to add another layer into this to, uh, to actually have some very specific public process on the, on the, met, the benefits, the community benefits agreement. So that's, you know, we're, we're gonna you know, do that after the May event. So in order to, why after the May event is by then, US2 and at a neighborhood level have a much more a solid understanding of the program and what the numbers and what everything's gonna be created and planned for in, the, in these neighborhoods and these development parcels. So, but why is that important? So the, that, that will lead us still to get into a neighborhood plan, which a neighborhood plan informs zoning and informs poli policy decisions and how things get implemented in the city. So, you know, the, right now the existing zoning and the proposed zoning, if there are issues in the proposed zoning right now, we, and the neighborhood plan is the conduit to get that vision out there and to, and to be implemented through the policies of the city, such as zoning. And then what, and then, as in Gilman Square, that can directly affect capital budgets and how the city allocates money. So in Gilman Square, they've, they've added um, the actual construction of the square to the, to the capital investment plan. So that's why this is a very, you know, this is an important step in the city's implementation process and then moving all of these visions forward. So first off, building, you know, what, you know, what is Union Square? That's a question we've been asking a lot throughout this process. But what we heard was a number of things. I mean, this is sort of the historic center of Somerville. You know, this, is, this was the intersection of Bow and Prospect, or excuse me, Bow and, um, and Somerville Ave. So that was a really compelling image for our team. And then, you know, we looked at, well, what are these contributing pieces of the neighborhood from a physical realm standpoint um, that need to be preserved and need to have sort of, you know, their heritage buildings, if you will, that have important, either cultural or, or physical significance. So that's a map of these, and we can we can go in a lot more detail of what which ones are on there uh, during the pinup. But there, you know, there are buildings like this. You know, you see these iconic sort of character contributing buildings to the neighborhood, and you know, those are all we've all mapped, and that that adds to the uh, the physical realm. But what's really unique about Union Square is the vibrant community here, the people. So you know, that's also a thing we want to we want to make sure that this plan captures. And it's not just you know it's not just social activity, but it's cultural and, and entrepreneurial activity. You know, we've heard from a number of folks in, in artist asylum and the sort of fabrication area. Uh, you know, that how do they stay in the neighborhood? How do they expand in the neighborhood? So we've asked a lot of those questions. So we really want to understand how this plan can keep a lot of what makes Union Square great here. So that thinking we've tried to embed into this plan and been very sensitive about how the. Uh, how the transformation areas can complement it. So this is a sort of a, a map of a lot of the, the, the things we've seen, and you know, this is, you know, we've kind of tried to zoom in even further throughout the last couple of days. But then what's important is, you know, how does that community stay together and stay in place and, and grow as Union Square with its proximity to Boston and its proximity to all of the other uh, uh, metro area sort of centers that is happening can participate in that, um, you know, and the, and the thriving economy and the thriving metro region we have to live in. So I think also a lot of those other places around Boston and Cambridge look to Union Square for inspiration. So how do we make sure that we keep 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 that culture in place and keep that heritage of of throwing great events and having a really uh, a lot of great social capital in place? Um, so these images are great. So this you know this was some watching some of these images, uh, you know, kind of experiencing this over the last couple months and. You know, I live in Boston, so I come to Union Square quite a bit. Um, what's great about this is that people are using the streets, and that's so rare in, in, in cities today, that you actually go out, close the streets, you know, you, and, and experience that as public space. You know, in Bow Street, I mean, I've seen so many people jaywalk on Bow Street. It's just, you know, so that, that doesn't happen a lot of places. So I think that's unique about Union Square and something that we, we want to we kind of build on. So... You know, there's all other issues. You know, development without displacement, that's a very clear message, and we understand that. And that actually is part of the solution here is to not displace folks and, and coming up with smart ways to, to align policies and, and, and development to make that possible. So, you know, we very, you know, this was a striking image for me as well, is that, you know, how do we have a place that everyone feels is their own and is proud of? And, and so that, that was a, really a, an important uh, you know, keystone for the, this entire design process that we're going to show you now. 
Um, so what is happening? Now, these are the trends that I think it's always good to keep in mind. These are kind of the emerging conditions. So, you know, 15% of Somerville now has access to, to, to rail transit. Um, you know, 85% when the green line's done. So the city on a whole is going, to, is going to transform due to just the way people get around. So this, you know, where most folks might drive now or get on a bus, they might, you know, they might get on a rail and walk. So that's really, that's really what, um, you know, is framing a lot of the discussion around. And, you know, just on a, this is the estimates for ridership. Um, you know, so this is an existing condition in our mind. You know, this is happening, this is a sort of fixed point in time. Um, so we, 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 you know, we, a lot of this thinking is designed around this station. So the state, you know, that MBTA project, that, you know, that large, you know, city, you know, regional impacting transit project uh, created the revitalization plan for Union Square. So how do you, you know, a lot of places across the country are trying to understand how land use and, and transportation infrastructure can come together to the benefits of those communities. So in Union Square, the, you know, the city put out this revitalization plan, and that's, you know, that's pretty innovative for, for a place like Somerville to, to try to couple land use and transportation and, and get, the, um, get those in sync. So, you know, so that, you know, our, this is kind of our study area, but the, the D parcels um, are what's shown in pink, you know, about 12 acres. So that, just to orient everyone, and that's really the redevelopment plan. So we always look to summer vision. That's the city's comprehensive plan. How many folks have read this? Okay. Okay. Good. So, um, you know, in 2009, a process was started. You know, it was a, a very involved community process. It sets out some uh, some pretty clear target numbers, and we've been really looking hard at how we can achieve those for for some, for Union Square and for Boyne Yards. Um, so I just want to make you know, take a few minutes to walk folks through that to, uh, to give us a context. But Union Square is one of the more complex pieces of the comprehensive plan because it has neighborhood preservation, green, uh, enhancement areas around transit, which is blue, and then transformational areas, which is the orange. And all of those kind of stack up together on a, uh, you know, in the corner there near Boyne Yards. And then Washington Street, we've heard a lot from folks that we can't forget Washington Street either. That, tra that transit node is actually, you know, if you're kind of in this building, you might walk out the front door and choose to go to Washington Street before you might go to, to, uh, to Union Square. So that was something that, you know, spatially we had to keep, keep in mind. Um, so these are just some, some pages pulled from Summer Vision. Um, you know, 9% is so the enhancement area, you know, 9% uh, of the open space, you know, and then the transformation in 15%. So we're, you know, that's what, kind of what, what, excuse me, what makes up the areas of the city. So you can see there's quite a number of, of acres uh, in, in the transformation zone. Um, and this, so the comprehensive plan just looks at land area. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a gross number. And now in our neighborhood planning, we've tried to take these numbers down to reality, where are sidewalks, where are developable parcels, where do parks go. Um, but just to summer, you know, to sort of reference everyone, there's the 35 acres of Boyne Yards at land area and Union Square of 25 acres. So if you actually take out those existing streets and you just look at the buildable area, those numbers come down further. So that's 28 acres in Boyne Yards and 20 acres in Union Square. Um, and you can see there the percentage of growth that, that in the comprehensive plan that are, are expected. So framing that even closer to the job target, that's 2,500 jobs in Boyne Yards and 1,800 jobs in, in, in Union Square. Um, so that's what we've been, we've been working on building. How do we hold all of those jobs? So looking at, this is weekly salaries in, in Somerville. Um, you, know, you can see the range and all. So these are the types of jobs that are in the city now. Um, and, when we talk a little bit about the fiscal impact study later, we'll, we can ask a few more. We can get into that further. But you know, looking at the highest-paying positions by salary in, in the area, you, know, you can see that you, know, you can see where things uh, are currently. And this is you know this is interesting to us because you know, these jo types of jobs also create more jobs, and that's some of the the economics we've looked at. Um, so how do we? How do we also balance that with residential? 
we all know that there's a shortage of residential regionally. You know, there, there's, there's been a lot of study about that, a lot of discussion. So we go back to the comprehensive plan. You know, this was an open public process, a lot of discussion, many years of thinking went into this, and a lot of meetings like this. So 500 units in Boyne Yards and 350 units in Union Square is the growth target for those areas. Um, so then if you look at, at affordable housing, so through the city's uh, zoning update, um, you know, there's a lot of inclusionary housing units that can be delivered through that mechanism, and then also purpose-built, which is sort of outside of the required um, regulatory creation of affordable units. Um, so that's an important note to make. So on the open space, now this is something we need to have a lot more discussion about, I think, is where does this go? Because we've been really trying hard to find open space, and there are some trade-offs that we have to talk about in, in that regard. Um, and, and Union Square, you know, it's a, an existing place. There's, there might be some funny places to put new open space, but to get large tracts of open space, um, that might require some decisions for, and trade-offs that we have to talk about. So this is existing open space in Union Square. And just sort of orient the pink in the center, that's the, uh, the, the plaza. Um, that's kind of, for me, that's a, I think of that as the center or that as the space in Union Square, just I think because of the farmer market. Um, but what we've also experienced is that definition is very different for lots of folks, depending on who you ask. What, what's the open space? Where's Union Square? All that. So I think that was also um, a design sort of thread is, you know, Union Square is a collection of very different types of experiences. And how can we use that and build from that and not lose that character? So. Another thing is, you know, there's great icons. There's, great, you know, there's very interesting views from Prospect Hill, the monument there. Um, and how do we build these open spaces that that allow the community to do different things? And you, you know, you hang out here and you do something very differently here than you might do down in a, you know, in a, in a, in a playground or a park. You know, so looking at all of the spectrum of possible open spaces, you know, the plaza does very different things than, than the park does. And then the pocket park, which you know is you know can be community gardens, can be smaller, more intimate uh, type spaces. Um, so all of these serve a purpose in the in the neighborhood, and we're looking to say how can we, you know, how can we provide many different you know pieces of that. Um, and then buildings, so a range of different building types: small, big, large, cheap rent, you know, other rent, office, co-working. We've looked at all these types of buildings, and the city's actually been really ahead of the curve in large cities in the U.S. on this by the new zoning code is, is building type based. So it actually regulates by what type of building it is. So that, that allows us to really preserve character and, and really any new building that comes in online is, is thought about as a piece of this set of building types. So you know, pulling together um, um, all of that sort of context. So Part two is kind of the, uh, all of our ideas. So um, starting with open space. And this is a draft, this is a pinup, so those X's should have been filled in. Um, but uh, we looked at a lot of uh, spots to put open space in, and you can see here that you know, existing to proposed. So the light blue, are potential expand expansions, and we can go into some of those ideas. The uh, existing plaza can be enhanced further, um, and then there's some other ideas for how we can you know, develop privately owned or sort of back courtyard areas into into public into you know spaces that might be used and more publicly accessible. Now you can see from this map that there. You know, there's not a large park on there, so the potential for that might exist down in Boyne Yards. So we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. But we've, you know, we've tried our best to shoehorn new public space and, and new parks in, but it's just there's not a lot of land for it here. Yeah. So. I don't know if we have a pointer. Yeah. So, thanks, Brad. So, the, there's the plaza. Okay, come down to D2, Brad. So there's D2, all right. And then that's so that's right next to the new train station. D3 
is right there. And then let's come up to D, D1, just to orient people. There's D1, the police and fire station. Is everyone, is that good? Okay. All right, thanks, Brad. Oh, Boyne Yards. Okay, so that's Boyne Yards there. And I, we might actually have a slide that shows all that later. So, um, so just to think about this a little bit differently is, you know, right now you, you have these these green spaces, these parks and all. And if you look at, if you think of some of those photos of the events and all and, and everything, it happens in in the streets. So we've been starting to think about, well, how can the public space be thought of as the streets too? And how can we make enhancements to the streets that actually allow it to be much more enjoyable space to spend time in? And maybe make your day, daily lives a little bit like some of those events, where it's just the street is a casual place to congregate and, and enjoy being in Union Square. So we've thought about you know, the, the intersections. You know, there's some very interesting things we could do to improve the intersections to make that possible. And then how we treat or, or repave or enhance the streets that connect those. So for us, this is kind of, it, it might be a solution to how we get a lot more open space, but it's a different kind of open space. Um, sorry, some feedback here. Um, understand how these parts interacted with that street network. So we've kind of mapped them by distance walked from the sort of center of you know the center intersection there, which is Summerville Ave and Webster and Bow Street. Just to get an understanding of that whole open space network and how those can start to be a, a, a complete experience between them. Russ, just just to catch for a minute because there's a couple things. We do these very fast. We do these over three days. Um, the um, the cemetery got caught to do open space. It's actually an existing open space. It's not on here. The thing marked at Walnut Street Park is actually the um, the parcel of Test, land at 9 on Aldersey Street, which is actually a privately owned kind of piece that has been a development issue over the next couple of years. And the last 20 years or so, I, I think it would be a very interesting future park site, but it isn't today. But that's the, 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 the details are a little off, and we'll work yeah, on so that. Yeah, so that just. This is halfway through our process, so you're seeing this is really a collaborative design effort. So there will be some corrections we need to make. So keep that in mind. Thanks, George. So, so moving on to okay, well, how do we think about open space and then what we're calling sort of the D parcels or that that darker pink, and then the transformation area, which is Boyne Yards. So that that's the transformation in Boyne Yards. So that. That's where we have potential for new open space as well. So does that help orient everyone? Yeah. All right, so all right, so and we went, th went through and you know, calculated all the square footages for everything just to kind of understand uh, the sizing there. So, so fabrication, that's how we thought about this area of the neighborhood, which is you know, down near Artisan Asylum and Brooklyn Boulders and sort of um, you know, towards the west on Somerville Ave. Now, we mapped all of the existing fabrication, maker, uh, artisan, you know, co-working, innovation, all accelerators. We tried to map all of those and understand where they were clustering and how that proximity was important. And studying some of these case studies of sort of other areas that are trying to do what Union Square is doing and, and sort of some thinking around that is that the proximity of each of these uses together is very important, but also their proximity to being on the edge or not necessarily in the center of the neighborhood is important as well. So we looked, so this is what's happening now. You can see it's, you know, it is. It's sort of, it's not, it's not right in the center of Union Square. So that was important to keep in mind as we started to think about how can some of these uses expand and stay in Union Square. So this is a map of just uh, of the sort of the fabrication area um, of what's there now and, and trying to document it. Now, the building, the building footprints you see in blue, oh. all 
right, here we go. All right, look at that, there we go. So these blue buildings, so they're, they're sort of in that heritage building type. You know, some of these are really great historic warehouse buildings that might not necessarily be compatible uses with how this might grow with keeping these fabrication businesses in place or expanding. So we thought, okay, well, if over time some of these uses uh, are, dis are, are, are given away or moved and those buildings stay, what can we achieve by expanding the fabrication jobs and, 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 and uh, locations and the, the buildings that house those? So we looked at some of these buildings that could take on more of those types of uses because they require certain things of the buildings they're in. And we, could al we almost found doubled the space in just that, that little area. So that's a really you know, interesting way that Union Square could grow without growing. You know, this is space that's already there. Um, and it's important because so these buildings are, are built of the type that can provide the needs of, of the makers and the fabricators and, and all that good stuff. So that was a really interesting uh, finding. Um, so how we do that, we can talk about more. Um, so looking at that further, so we've mapped all the historic fabric, you know, sort of uh, within the square. And, and that's another piece of this. And you can see that a lot of that, that fabrication uses might expand into those, uh, those historic sites. Now parking, parking is always an issue. Um, so those, you know, those buildings, you know, if you go into Brooklyn Boulder, if you, you know, go down there, you see, this is the parking that, you know, it's bicycle parking that's there. So I started to think, is there a creative way, we might have to start about creative ways if we're expanding, rather than filling up with parking spaces, that that zone might have really special conditions on it about parking to encourage the pattern that's already in place. So we're not, we're not filling up more land in the, the neighborhood with parking that's not needed. Uh, and this is some great, you know, that's a, par that's a bike parking garage. Um, so you could get really serious about this. Um, so now this is where I'll, I'll try and orient everyone to these sketches, but all of these are pinned up so you can get a closer look. But this is looking at some of the expansion on Somerville Ave and how we might think about some of the surface parking lots that are in there and becoming uh, much more productive than just housing cars. Um, and then, you know, how can we actually knit together some more housing that might infill some of these parking lots and more uh, sort of Main Street oriented buildings on Somerville Ave, which is really Union Square's Main Street experience. And then looking at some more radical ideas about how do we really expand uh, the maker space, fabrication space on a much more significant scale. Um, and this is, you know, this could be mixed use or fabrication. And then also, you know, how can we do fabrication infill? You know, this could be you know, very inexpensively built modular that comes in and infills some of those parking lots to expand these uses. Um, and then there's another version. And then, so looking at, you know, this is Somerville Ave here, looking at some very quick ways to, to infill with very light liner buildings, because one of the things on Somerville Ave to encourage, encourage better walking throughout the neighborhood, it's walking past some of these sort of, you know, gaps, you know, missing teeth in the, in, in the, in the, in the street, you know, in front of Market Basket is kind of one of those experiences where you know you kind of you've got a you know fairly intact you know neighborhood oriented street and then you've got a you know a, a large hole and void you know some folks are calling them parking craters where you just kind of have a crater of parking in your neighborhood um, so how can we start to hide some of those places now you know these are the buildings we we're talking about and you know over time new windows can go in. You know, and new, and, you know, new uses can be explored. You know, and this is this is a pretty unique space uh, that you find in, I would say, in the, in the entire Boston region. You know, and how can you know? Right now, this is kind of overflow parking, but you know, it could be a much more pleasing and pedestrian-oriented experience. And that's new public space in my mind. You know, it's that's not being very well used now, and you know, imagine how neat that could be. Um, same with here. Um, you know, this is just around the corner. You know, the pirate ship and and uh, Greentown Labs, but this is, you know, this is another sort of alleyway condition that, you know, if you look at Melbourne, Australia, and other big cities are, th are thinking about how these, uh, how these spaces can be more productive in, in people, people spaces. So that's another opportunity, and these are some quick sketches we did to kind of think, think about that. So moving down some of the lab a little bit more, you know, here's, you know, Market Basket. 
it's kind of a transition for us, that gap in the street that we talked about where the parking crater is. Um, you know, we thought, okay, well, bar, you know, a walkable grocery store is a fantastic thing to have in a neighborhood. Everyone knows that. We all know that. So looking at, okay, well, how can we make it a better street? That was the first thing. You know, these are very little buildings, 20 to 30 feet deep, that just sort of line, you know, make this street feel complete. So when you walk on it, you feel like you're in that main street, that sort of outdoor room. And then still make it very accessible to pedestrians and cars to get in and out. Um, so that starts to sort of repair that, that edge of the street. And then that could get bigger and maybe have housing or, or office space above. You know, still sort of very thin buildings, um, you know, fairly low intensity. And we did some quick, you know, when we did some surveying early on in the crowdsourcing meeting, there was a lot of red dots on this parking lot and a lot of green dots on, on, on the building. So, the part, so we're, we kind of said, well, let's explore what, how to improve the red side of the site as much as possible. And you know, parking is a big part of that. So we sort of said, we can make this parking lot more efficient and possibly add some more spaces over here. And you know, even though we're adding a building in the front, we, the parking lot could still work. But we know there's congestion issues there in and out and all. So, so we want to we hear some more feedback on some of those sketches from you all. So the Rite Aid site is another interesting, you know, this is, you know, these are kind of anomalies in, 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 this, in Union Square. You know, Target is also one of them. Um, where they're really auto-oriented, you know, they kind of put the parking out front. So we looked at that too and just did some quick studies of, you know, if, if this is Somerville Avenue here, this is the Rite Aid, can it be flipped? It's sort of, can we put it backwards and, and, you know, can it be mixed use with Rite Aid on the corner so it's a corner store, it kind of behaves as it should with its neighbors. Then this is something we'll get to later, but that we're showing a new T station there too, which uh, we can. Oh, it's kind of an interesting idea. Um, so this is another version, you know, kind of you know more infill and a few uh, residential apartments. Um, so sort of talking about uh, uh, how all these narrow spaces evolve, and this sort of might apply to some of the other streets in the neighborhood, but. You know, shared space is is very quickly uh, kind of going across the country as a, a new type of street. Um, you know, this is one in Georgetown, um, and these are not, you know, these are not uncommon to Boston. You know, parts of Downtown Crossing are like this. Parts of, of Harvard Square are beginning to think like this, and there's a lot more we've heard that are in the engineering phase across the country right now. But what they are basically are is it, it allows this this outdoor room to really be as multifunctional as possible and as safe as, as possible. So the car exists as, with the pedestrian and the bicyclist, and everything moves as sort of a dance. You know, everyone's kind of, you know, kind of un, under, respecting each other and moving around each other, and it's very slow moving. You know, so that we, you know, we started to think about how can we better, um, better take advantage of the streets in Union Square, and this is, this is you know, one of my, Sort of favorite experiences is jaywalking this street from from the donut shop to the coffee shop. Um, right, so we'll get to that. Um, it actually makes the street safer when you jaywalk. You know, cars kind of slow down; they expect it. You know, so this right now is the existing conditions, and just notice how much from that line to that line, how much space is just dedicated to automobiles. You know, I think this is one of the biggest opportunities that we have in this, in Union Square, is making Bow Street really a place for people. Now, I'm not saying cars aren't there, they're still there, they just aren't the priority. People are the priority. So this is thinking about shared space and really allowing these businesses to flourish and create these little pockets. You know, this is out in front of the church. And this here, these, these buildings are actually on D7. You know, so they're, you know, you see them come up out of the ground and possibly new, you know, new stores and new shops, my, you know, neighborhood oriented stuff would be there. And so that, you know, that in my mind, I get really excited about how we can create public space and land we already have. Um, so looking at you know, the Union Square Plaza, you know, that, this is sort of, you know, the, the, in my mind, the sort of, it, you know, everything kind of leads down to this in my mind, you know, the sort of you come through Bow Street, all these, all these roads collide here. And so we looked, this is a sketch we did, just kind of thinking through a number of different ideas here. And I can, I'll just kind of hit the high points. But first, sort of moving from left to right, is the Somerville Ave, Webster, Bow Street, sort of, I call this the bow tie sort of colli colliding intersection. You know, 
you just look at all the pork chop sort of islands. You have to kind of skip across as you, you know, try to get from one side to the other. And, you know, it's, you know, just trying to walk from here over to here. I mean, any of them are, we've all done that. So this is sort of saying, let's think about how we make that into a public space, you know, and, and that was one version of it. You know, and this shows the sort of D7, you know, housing that would come online there with, you know, a lot of discussion about that being family oriented, uh, affordable project. And then, and then here, thinking about how the, the inside of these blocks, the sort of the back courtyards, you know, there's a number of those conditions around Union Square, you know, most notably sort of behind the independent, you know, the sort of, you know, what's happening back in here is very interesting. And we said, well, you know, let's, let's figure out if these back courtyards could actually be really dynamic um, places that people come to, to enjoy that being outdoors. And you know, some of it has public, a public park that has a chain link fence and sort of like, let's figure out how we can make those two work together. And then let's figure out how we can make a new one. So that was another way we could probably find some more usable outdoor space. And then the plaza, you know, there's some very small tricks of like landscaping, you know, the, the hardscape that's there that would very quickly allow this to be a lot more flexible. And for one, you know, sort of, has anyone tripped over the little curbs covered by the trees? You know, it's like that little six inches says, don't come up here. So if we can just redesign that area, then I think this, the, the amount of land or the way this whole space functions kind of grows. So that's one quick idea we had. But, um, you know, leading to, well, let's find some new public space. So this is the intersection of Prospect here coming into Washington Street. And we looked at, you know, this is kind of an interesting intersection, and we kind of looked at how this parcel might re be redeveloped into an office building. And we thought, well, this is really sort of, you know, great public spaces always exist in, in sort of clusters or pairs, you know, like the main square has a smaller square. Um, so we thought, well, is there a way we could actually make a new park there? Small little park that sort of, you know, is sort of a gateway into Union Square. And then, you know, we've heard a lot of discussion about Ricky's as a really important use, you know, important piece of the community. So can that actually be, you know, relocated and, and put into a fairly, you know, signature building, something that's, you know, very beautiful and sort of, you know, ex can expand out into the park and... and you know. uh, so, yeah, just to orient folks, this is D2 here. All right, here's the new t train station, Prospect Street. This is D4. D6. D sorry, D6. You can tell we get confused with these two. That's the, uh, the old fire station there. Show where the CrossFit building There's the CrossFit building. Right there. The CrossFit building is right there. That's SCAT TV, yes. Excuse me. The CrossFit building is right there. This is the substation here. Um, all right, so this is D1, and we'll, we'll get to more of that a, a little later. So the intersection there at Webster, Somerville Ave, and Bow Street. So let me orient folks. This is... Uh, this is Somerville Ave coming through. This is Somerville Ave being converted to two ways. So you know, really well-functioning main streets have sort of, if you think from building face to building face, it's 50% of the space is sidewalk, 50% of the space is pavement, and the most well-functioning main streets have two-way traffic. You know, it just allows all the stores and all of the trips to, to interact the best. So we thought, you know, that's, you know, let's, in, let's try and enhance all of these existing businesses and these existing buildings by just supporting a better functioning Main Street. So that, you know, so we looked at, we modeled this in traffic, and we'll get into this later to show you how this actually functions. But this is where it gets really interesting. And the first time I saw that, I thought, wow, how does that work? So, you know, this is actually one light that makes all of these movements possible. So there's no more sort of sequencing and all that, and, and you know, multiple people coming through in different directions. But what happens is we're allowed to expand public space here. We're allowed to expand public space here. This is this is the, um, and I can be, yeah. And then this, this existing. So this is this is D uh, D seven. This is the bank and reliable. <laughs> This is Somerville Ave here. This is this is Webster here. This is Washington. And th this here is Somerville Ave coming through. And this is Bow Street. 
All right, so, so you can see here that we've actually, just by rationalizing this intersection, we've created you know, one, two new uh, attached plazas and an enlarged an existing one. Um, and we'll show you how this works from a traffic standpoint. So speaking of traffic, so let's, let's, let's kind of talk about McGrath Highway. Um, so you know, a lot of what, you know, a lot of the discussion, you know, Mass DOT was here during the charrette and talking about when this, when this gets de-elevated and becomes a, an urban boulevard or an urban avenue or, or a street that you can walk across, let's put it that way. Um, what happens and how can we, how can we you know, understand that and how it might function with Union Square? So there it is today. Um, this was a good idea at some point in time. Um, so this is a model of, of what that street could look like, um, a street section. So this is, you know, the street section, just to, to orient everyone, is, is basically from the property line to the property line. What happens? How many lanes are there? You know, how many parking lanes are there? So in the same street section that McGrath Highway sits on now, we can build sidewalks that are nice and wide. We can build a, a lane of parking. We can build a local lane for slower moving traffic to access all of the houses and the buildings that are fronting McGrath Highway. We can build a 10-foot uh, boulevard with plant, planted boulevard, trees and all. And then we're suggesting that, that, that Somerville support the, the four-lane version of McGrath Highway. That's, that's, four, that's two lanes in both directions. And then we can actually build a, a multi-use path. So that's, that's sort of jargon for a, a sort of alley of bike paths with gorgeous trees, uh, sidewalks, running paths. So there's 40 feet there of linear public space that can be created it's from Washington Street all the way through to where the target site is. And that, you know, and then there's also a local access road on this side and another large sidewalk with even more trees. So that, that seems pretty good to me. Um, there it is. So you can see Washington Street as you're walking up Washington Street to the T, you know, to get on the, the new Washington Street train line is right here. This is McGrath Highway. This is where it goes up the bridge here to go over the, the rail line and into Cambridge. Um, so there's a few other things here that I'll get to, but just want to let everyone, you know, that section of McGrath Highway could, you know, could have that kind of street section. And then we've also, this bikeway, you know, and this is this walking path, can run along the side of McGrath Highway here and link into other networks that we've looked at around Union Square. Now the other thing that's going on here is, is you know, being up against a highway, you can look at the big dig in Boston and see what's kind of occurring next to that new park. You know, the, there's some left sort of land here and, and sort of key intersections that might take advantage and look at, at this as being an, uh, you know, a neighborhood amenity and street and be redeveloped, as well as the sort of auto-oriented Target. Now, we're not, now, Target is actually another great use to have in your neighborhood, but Target also has an urban store, has a multi-level store, has a store that's oriented for people who are coming there by foot. So in the long term, sort of thinking ahead, how do we make this, you know, think about this uh, auto-oriented uh, land as uh, a, a potential expansion of Boyne Yards and, you know, another area where uh, walkable streets and, 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 you know, office buildings, lab buildings, you know, maker space can all be created. So, you know, going from left to right, I'll kind of explain what's happening here. You know, there's an existing building there that the MBTA we heard just recently purchased or owns now. We're not, we're not sure what they're going to do with it, but we actually think the, the bones of it could be a well, you know, a good spot for a fabrication type use to expand. So that's kind of what's looking, what's going on there. And then the target site, the, the building actually sits right there now. So. Uh, the idea is that the target could remain or it could be replaced by mixed use, uh, taller uh, parking structures with buildings wrapping them to actually create uh, an extent, extension of the neighborhood. Um, and then this new block tries to do several things here. This is, 
This is realigning all the sort of intersection that you have out in front of Target now to create perhaps a new site for a library, you know, which would be an incredibly cool civic building that, it, that terminates. Sort of, you know, you'll have a view of it from all of these major streets, McGrath Highway going in both directions, as well as coming down Somerville Ave, you'll see that. So that could be uh, Somerville's sort of a, a civic building that anchors uh, Union Square, the, at this edge of Union Square and is a real gateway moment. And then this is sort of looking at, if you look at the, what's, uh, the city's comprehensive plan talks about, what Summer Vision talks about for, for Brick Bottom and Inner Belt, which are all over here, you know, it might make sense to, to tie in some better pedestrian connections, some better bike facilities over there, as well as some, um, some local auto connections. So this is looking at how do we actually make a better sort of block structure that's more broken down, more oriented towards uh, a mix of uses. And then, you know, how can Medford Street um, be calmed and actually participate in being part of the, you know, this sort of neighborhood system? So this is a strong movement going into Cambridge now. But so we wanted to preserve that to happen, but also wanted to allow that connection, that future connection uh, into this, this sort of evolving neighborhood to, to occur. Um, so looking more, a little more at Target. You know, so this is Pat's toe. You know, so Target, this is Medford here. Uh, this is the uh, sort of the McGrath Highway overpass here. Um, so you know, there, there's quite a bit of, uh, of land available there. So I'm sorry, Pat's toe is up here. This is sort of on the other side of the tracks from Pat's toe. Um, so this is Medford Street before you go under the tracks. So what's important here is, is as you go into Boyne Yards and come down Medford Street, and then this is the green line. You know, the green line comes uh, right past this site. This could be another, another T-stop right there. You know, somewhere along, and we put, it, we put it right there for a reason we'll get to later, but it has to do with this existing rail line here. Um, but this is a, a possible transit-oriented development. You know, this could be other, other large format buildings that actually, uh, you know, don't affect their neighbors much. You know, this is sort of trapped in by all of these pieces of infrastructure. So we looked at, is there a better way that that site could, uh, could take more uh, expansion and not really uh, affect m many of the neighbors? And then another version of that, so this is, this is the, the green line here, rail corridor. This is Medford Street coming through. So this is Patstow. This is sort of the bridge going up. So this is looking at another version of how the, how the McGrath Highway as a McGrath, or McGrath Boulevard could come in and, and meet Medford Street. You know, and this might preserve that, uh, that uh, connection down into Cambridge. And then looking at how Target might you know, add a parking structure for, for its, its surface parking lot, trade that for some more mixed use buildings that could go on the site, whether that's office, lab, uh, or other use, we're not sure. Now, th those are all fairly intense sort of redevelopments. It's, you know, it's sort of a retrofit of that entire uh, parcel of land. But how can Target just become a better neighbor uh, in, a, in an incremental fashion? So if you look here, this is the Target site here. This is Medford. Somerville Ave is up here. So we looked at, okay, the Target use stays, the building stays, uh, but perhaps the secondary building uh, goes away, and parking is built uh, inside that block with new uh, residential or, or other use on the side. And then a new sort of mixed-use building might hold the corner with additional retail, so that that corner at Somerville Ave and McGrath Boulevard uh, is held with a, a nice gateway building. And then, you know, a lot of public, you know, a lot of the parking lot could have sort of a we thought a kind of market shed or mixed use shed, you know, some sort of interesting way to line the parking lot that could also be used for outdoor events and programming there. And then there might be a sort of, we thought like you know, Shake Shack or some sort of restaurant that actually comes out and, and engages the street. So there might be a way that we can actually make Target this whole sort of auto-oriented site behave and become part of the neighborhood. Um, and then, you know, here might be another uh, a new retail or new uh, uh, expansion building there. Now, the one other thing to note about this is this parking structure connecting across to Boyne Yards. Uh, this was an early idea for how we can accommodate more cars and also 
make sort of the local traffic in and from, you know, into Boyne Yards, um, give that a little relief from only using Medford Street and, and Webster. Um, so here's another version of that, very similar, but this looks at putting uh, this intersection um, as a public space with an iconic building there. Uh, the traffic engineers didn't like that one. Um, but this is also another version of sort of, of retrofitting uh, Target into, a, into an urban sort of mixed use uh, uh, edge of the neighborhood. Um, that's another version oriented a little differently. This is another version that we, some of us got very fascinated by the sort of crankiness or sort of this very, it's actually very picturesque, the curved streets that you find around Union Square. So can that sort of, you know, be a way to redevelop as well? You know, that's still in the character of the sort of block structure and streets you have in the neighborhood. So let's dive in a little bit de more detail. Um, so D1, um, you know, we were just talking about Target, but, you know, so D1 is one of the larger development parcels. Um, you know, we did a number of studies. This looks at a, at a library, some office. Um, this looks at, you know, a, a more contemporary library with a cafe, some office, and then some townhouses. We also looked at, you know, how can the, how could office anchor the corner of Prospect and Somerville Ave? And that kind of starts to influence what happens on D1 as well. So we looked at the library, you know, these are some quick sketches of the library, you know, retail and then some residential. This is another version of the library here. Now, looking at, at another version, so this looks at pulling back. Uh, this, is, this is where Washington Street comes into Somerville Ave. It's pulling back the development uh, on, on D1 to add uh, a small park or small open space. Uh, this is looking at sort of a courtyard building and how, d how these other D parcels uh, adjacent to the post office might build out. This is another version with a, a courtyard, additional open space in the center here. And this is sort of a diagram of the library, the office, and the residential again. Sort of that sequence in a few different organizations. Can you explain what you call the fire station? So, so this is the... So this is scat here, excuse me. Uh, it's it is it's there. We haven't yeah, we haven't we haven't done anything with it. the building's there. The over the course of time I've heard ideas of scat staying in that building. Um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with the leadership about scat about their their needs for a modern table space and whether they'd be happier there, they'd be happier somewhere else. I mean the, the general idea is we're determined to keep Scat in Union Square. It's very important to us. Um, you know, if 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 the park and the and the, the, the layout of that space and the use of that building makes more sense doing something else, it would we would be all be responsible as a city of finding a place for Scat to fit somewhere somewhere else nearby. I mean, with so much possibility of of different buildings, there's a chance to potentially take a new building that that that, that offers. Um, a, a, a space that might be better for them and look at the possibility of that as something else. There's, as, as I said through this neighborhood plan process, there's no determination of, of, of any of those ideas. I mean, it's a matter of if, 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 if we all say the most prominent, logical place for our cable TV station is right on our central plaza, then we can do that. If, it, if we conclude that the most prominent use of that site is something else and our cable TV station should be across the street in one of our modern office buildings, we can do that. So it's really, it's, I need the feedback. That's part of what I need, and that's what we're going to do through the process. I want yeah, to so, finish yeah, so, we'll get to that. So I'm going to keep going. For the sake of time, and I want to make sure everyone has opportunity to give us the feedback and, and look at a lot more of this in detail, I, I'm going to try and, I might touch upon some of these but, and then offer, you know, direct you to the boards afterwards. But this is other ideas for D1 of a, you know, a vertically mixed use library, public market on top of the greenhouse. Um, now D2, or to everyone, you know, everyone understands D2 is directly adjacent to the train station. Um, we looked at a few versions of these. This is an office building on the corner of Somerville Ave and Prospect. This is a mixed-use residential building wrapping parking. This is the train station, and this is a new park adjacent to the train station and, and, and here on this uh, sort of the, the back 
corner of the site, connecting into the, the neighborhood street behind. It's another version of D2. This is Prospect Street here. This is looking at a series of, of mixed-use buildings. Um, this is pulled back uh, to, to take advantage of you know, the two entrances and under, the grade difference. You know, this is the, the bridge coming up. We have to provide accessibility down into these lower entrances. Um, and then this is looking at you know, building a, an, an alleyway or laneway in the back and additional parkland tying in in the back here at the, to the neighborhood street. Um, this is D2 as a park. Um, so this is what D2 is going to look like in the not too distant future if, if nothing happens on, on D2. So that's the existing train, that's in my mind the existing train station, that's what's going to be built. So there's Dunkin' Donuts and Prospect Street. So you can see here the large sort of turnaround sort of surface sort of parking lot for the ride vehicles and the curb cut. So that's sort of the existing condition that we based a lot of this thinking on. Now looking at the zoning and a lot of the, the sketches, we came up with this image of that. So this is looking at a new park here in Prospect Street at the edge. Now just to orient everyone, this is SCAT here. This is the existing building. This is, this is D4. Six. Six, sorry I keep doing that. <laughs> D6, this is the new park a possible relocated Rickies, you know, the, flower, you know, the landscape market. This is the train station here. So this is at the top of the, of the hill. You, know, you see it coming out there. This is the lower entrance. So it sets up an interesting sort of urban condition where you have a, you know, sort of some, some three-dimensional public space. We're thinking that this could actually evolve into a really interesting amphitheater where you know, some programmable outdoor space occurs adjacent to the station. And then that sort of welcomes you as you come out um, in, in, onto Prospect Street, where you see a number of different storefronts and, and retail. And then this is, you know, this is just sort of the massing uh, of a potential office building. And you see there beyond, that is D3. So that's an office building on D3 uh, coming up on the other side of the tracks. That there is the housing tower over in Inman Square. In Inman, yeah, sort of near Inman there on Cambridge Street. So here also, you know, from the, uh, you know, the thinking about how to use our public spaces, our, our streets and our right-of-ways better in the core of the square, you know, thinking about how this intersection can also be, um, you know, a very friendly pedestrian intersection, you know, a sharing of spaces. Um, so this could be a real gateway moment for, for Union Square. Um, and then this is a, a, you know, an outdoor, another outdoor sort of facility. Um, now looking back the other way, and this is a, a little less uh, refined than the, the first image, but so this, just to orient folks, so there's the train station there. You see it, there's the fin sort of of the roof. So this is D2 coming up, you know. So looking at, you know, residential, office, and then going down into the square, you see a little bit of, uh, of D1. And then this is the, um, uh, the sort of e edge of, uh, it's, I think it's D4. It's a piece of D4, sort of the triangular site there near the corner of, of Prospect and, and Webster. Um, so that we're thinking of as a park. And then, that, and then that intersection here where sort of Webster and Prospect, you know, it kind of all collides there. It's a, it's a tricky intersection. We've, we've actually rationalized that into a new park. You know, so it sets up a nice way for, for cars to kind of use it as a, as a square about, where you actually navigate fairly slowly around this, this new park. Um, and I, the traffic engineers are still working on this, but it might require no, no traffic lights there. And then this is D4 here. Um, and then you know, looking at the corner of D3 here uh, with, with potential retail and office above. Um, or Commercial, you know, we've been talking a lot about how these, you know, you know, how can the second floor be, you know, sort of a mix of uses, um, you know, fabrication maker, co-working, all of that. So D3, uh, down to D3. Um, so D3 is, uh, is really two parcels. There's this corner parcel here. This is the train station. Uh, this is the intersection of you know, this Webster here in Prospect. 
So looking at this as, as two parcels and, and being phased in uh, was kind of you know, sort of a constraint, a design constraint on, on this site. So this is an office uh, uh, development here with some parks and open space that hopefully will connect to a future pedestrian connection here. And we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, All right, th thanks, George. And then this is a mixed-use building um, here, uh, residential, um, as the as a, considered as the program. We'll get into the program for these. That what we're thinking about is the program a little later. This is another version of that same program with the street coming around and accessing parking behind. Still office, sort of holding the corner here, uh, and we set this back, thinking about how you know how the pedestrian. Um, experience coming out of the station might be enhanced um, on this side of the bridge. So there might be a future connection, expanded sidewalk, you know, more room for folks to walk up and get into the station. Um, this is another version. Um, and this version looks at putting the, the office oriented uh, in line with the train, uh, train tracks and then sets up a sort of plaza space um, between a smaller, lower-scale building that would maybe match the character of, of the existing, uh, existing. this is under construction now, but existing fabric in the neighborhood. And then how that might connect back into Boyne Yards, uh, provide maybe a better sort of walking path or desire line from the train station back into the transformation area that's Boyne Yards. Um, this is a, a variation on that. Some of these uh, are, are not are constrained by the property ownership here. So um, this is a very simple sort of courtyard building version. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but the, the thought is that there would, because of the grade here, so as you kind of walk up the sidewalk here and get on the bridge, there's a, quite a bit of grade difference in this corner of the site. Uh, so that's a... Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Okay, so... Bear with us here, everyone. Uh, per All right, so to answer the question about parking, that's where we're at. Um, so this is a logical place to put some parking to take advantage of that grade. Um, and then here we're showing parking, there, uh, a freestanding parking garage. But some of these other scenarios have parking sort of shared under uh, underground and possibly on a podium sort of behind the retail um, up against the, the railroad right away. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we went through all these. Um, so this is D4 across the street. So here's another uh, looking at some retail on the corner, residential, lower rise sort of infill. Uh, so this is a process. So the garden it doesn't might not show up on a few of these. So. It, there was a number of different people working on it, so we could. This is a we're in the middle of the process, so because uh, we weren't sure you wanted the garden, to be honest. So you know, we need to hear about that. So this is a, a mixed-use building, uh, housing above. This is another version that actually adds a garden to the side. So this is a community garden. So yeah, so. So I'd, re I'd really like everyone to, all, a lot of folks here who haven't talked want to get us the feedback written out, so. Uh, I need to hear my neighbors tell me I can't read your feedback when you're doing it in private. Yeah. So I need to hear, I don't know about that garden perhaps and why we might lose it. I will, here's what we will do. Okay, that's a great idea. That's a great idea, you are absolutely right. Uh, I'm going to do this. Unless you tell us otherwise on your form, I am going to photocopy, scan, and connect to every single feedback form on our website. And you can go to SomervilleByDesign.com on our website, or you can come into our office and you can look through every single form that every single person fills out tonight. We are not hiding things from people. We are happy to share the information that all of the neighbors have put together here. If I asked everyone to give me every piece of feedback on every one of the 90 plus things that are on that board, um, it's 
it, it's just unfortunately not the most efficient way to be able to get information from so many people here tonight. So the best thing to do, write down the information about the things on the forums you have. We process it, we put it together, we collect, and we certainly put information together as a whole. And, but at the same time, we also will make sure to share everything that everyone said with everyone else. Unless, if you want to, you can write on the bottom of your form, please don't share this if, if you want to do that. That is fine. Look, we... I, 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 I have, I, I, you know, I, I, we have, uh, we are going to do everything we can to hear what everyone has to say. We've had, we've had nine meetings over the last two nights where we've had people come and talk with each other. I am happy to do more of those, but I, the idea here was to have the opportunity to put together a bunch of ideas, put them out there, and get feedback on those ideas. Sometimes, I want to stress this now, Bring in a bunch of folks, some of them are from the city, some of them have been here a long time, some of them are from out of town at the first time. They look at a plan, they miss something. They miss an existing garden, it sounds like. We very quickly are able to correct those things because we are, as I said, in the middle of a process. Most communities and most planners will spend six months hiding in a room doing exactly what Russ is showing you up here, and we'll catch some of those things and we'll come back and we'll show you a set of finished plans. This is a very raw set of plans. We miss things. We miss the cemetery. I, I made Nine Aldersey Street a public park. I, you know, we are not perfect here, okay? Um, actually, it might be a great idea, but, I, but, but, but that's, that's, so that's where I just want to have a chance to have us plow through this information, catch as much as you can. If you want to sit and talk to each other, talk to us, we'll do that. But I just, uh, there's just a lot of, of production that was done here, and I'd like us all to be able to get a chance to see it. Yeah, we will. We will. We're, this is literally in the middle of the process. You know, we finished some of these drawings two minutes before they got onto the slide deck. So, folks, please bear with me here and let us get through all of the ideas so everyone can see the full breadth of the thinking. And then all of this is pinned up next door. If you want to talk about one of these more, we're going to have folks at each board listening, and, you're, and everyone can congregate around these images again. Yes, yeah. Yes. Uh, that is a good question. We can, we've put these boards in a very... Uh, we will do our best through the email and the, um, and, the, and the information to set up a couple more times when you can come see the boards, um, either here um, sometimes we brought him back to City Hall and left him there. I do, I, I prefer to do it here if I can get people here to kind of hang out with them on a couple of nights over the course of the next few weeks. So we'll find a way to do that. All right, so... There's still a lot to come, people. That's why I'm trying to get us through this. So there's still a lot more we need to show you. All right, so D5. Um, this is part of the building that we're in this evening. Uh, these are a few thoughts on uh, simply retrofitting uh, the gas station and expanding the existing building, reusing the building that's there on, on D5. Um, this could go up slightly for a sort of a, a low-rise building. Uh, this could also be a uh, small office space that could go above this, we looked at. Um, this is taking uh, D5 and redeveloping that parcel. Uh, you know, so this is a you know, re uh, ground floor retail and, and then office above. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I apologize. So this is, so this is the library. Sorry, oh, excuse me, post office. <laughs> It's getting late, folks. Bear with me. This is the post office here. This is uh, Washington Street. So literally right next door of the, from this building. Um, so D6. Um, so, D, so D6 is the Kawasaki block. Um, this, is, this is Somerville Ave here. And this is Prospect Street. So this is a version that looks at retail on the corner, retail on, the, on, on both buildings, ground floor. This is parking behind, accessed off Somerville Ave. And this is a, a sort of office lobby here. And then coming up, this is an office building on the corner. Uh, and this is uh, residential, 
with townhouses sort of facing the, the neighborhood street here. Russ, I so appreciate you for doing that. I just wanted to move on. Okay, all right. So, you know, sorry, this is, I know it's a... Yeah, Dunkin' Donuts is right here on this site, on that corner. Dunkin' Donuts is right here. This is the, the CrossFit building here. Uh, so again, Dunkin' Donuts is there. So this is a, di a different design. That's two buildings. Uh, both have parking inside the building here. Uh, retail along Somerville Ave and coming up Prospect. And then uh, office entrances sort of through this uh, sort of pedestrian path through the center of the site. What's the time frame? Uh, I, this, we're still halfway through the process, so I couldn't answer that. Um, because that Kawasaki dealership that once inspired me to get a motorcycle is now gone. But it's on the so so I, I can't answer that question right now, sir. Uh, so this, this is the office building above. We have two office buildings here with this plaza space. Uh, and this is sort of pulled back uh, to potentially preserve some, some public space here on the corner. Um, so this is also, this is another version of D6, very similar to that, two offices. And we heard a lot of thoughts about having that mid-block connection, you know, because the block face here along Somerville Ave is quite long. You know, it's, it's sort of, uh, uh, it'd be nice to have a little, a little relief. And then also this connection through the block um, folks might have a sort of shortcut to the train station uh, as well. Um, so this is another version of that, uh, looking at office in the center of the block and residential on the corner, and then that, that, that mid-block connection, uh, either pe pedestrian um, or limited access. So that's a very similar scheme. Um, this one looks at a slightly less uh, intense residential building on the corner. Uh, with townhouses or row houses on the side, you know, with, with front stoops and all, uh, sort of to meet the residential street behind. And then office here on this, this corner of the site, the summer of the lab here. Um, so looking at height, you know, what does that sort of D6 feel like from the plaza? So just this is scat here, everyone. And this is a, a process model. This is something we've been uh, using to, to help with the design. So it's, it's, it's a you know, it's still kind of boxy at this point. But so this is, um, you know, the inside the plaza, you can see a little bit of the parking there. Um, and then this is, this is one version uh, of, of height. This is five stories. This is seven stories. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 stories. So, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stories. Um, so what does that feel like, though, when you, you start to think? So you, you start to think about being in the space. So there's Scott again. This is sort of standing on the, about to get hit by the bus um, uh, on Somerville Ave. Um, and then this is thinking about it as, as sort of a very flexible public space. You know, where those, you know, we just redesign the, where the trees are. We sort of bring a unified paving, a unified experience from edge of building all the way to the edge of the existing buildings uh, to the north here. So this is the independent. You know, there's a sort of dining deck in the summer. There's the farmer's market. Here's the, here's the, the post office where we are. And then so there's D2 at the corner of Prospect. You know, there's the small, uh, the new park there on Prospect. And then here's the office building as envisioned on uh, on D6, you know, sort of the mid-block connection. Then C here, we've also expanded the sidewalk on that side of Somerville Ave. Um, so made that, made that a wider sidewalk, more generous for, you know, outdoor cafes or walking and, and you know, just a better connection into the, into the uh, up prospect and to the train station. So there's with that, the height, you know, and thinking about you know, the trade-offs I mentioned earlier and how do we provide more open space and, you know, all of this is somehow connected. So more office, you know, the economics of a large office building might require a certain amount of height to make it work. So, you know, looking at these two versions, um, you know, I thought was interesting. So I really want to hear the community's feedback on this. Um, so getting to D7, uh, D7 is really an important piece of, of the D blocks for us from a neighborhood plan standpoint, because it's really 
and I'll just orient everyone, you know, so D7, you know, this is Bow Street here. D7 is really the, uh, uh, the, tire, the tire building, the tire shop, and uh, the bank building, and then the parking lot behind. Um, so just to orient everyone, here's Bow Street again coming, coming up. This is Somerville Ave. So this is looking at uh, possibly just a reuse uh, of, of the one-story structure on the corner, and then some uh, three-story sort of walk-up townhouses behind, and then uh, a new retail sort of residential above uh, uh, mixed-use building on the corner. And the thinking here is that this would be a great spot for family housing sort of all built as once, you know, sort of affordable project that has, uh, you know, uh, family oriented. Um, I think, you know, this is another version looking at that upper floor of that residential building. And then also thinking about how, how does D7, you know, right now this is sort of a blank wall uh, behind the, the, tire built, the tire shop, and, you know, how this uh, sort of small courtyard uh, interacts with this, this building is important. And then the second piece here is, uh, you know, this is looking at how, because this is sort of going up into a neighborhood street, is how can the retail be oriented here towards Bow Street? And then quickly, you know, turn into more residential in character and possibly a community, community space, community room uh, uh, there on the ground floor. Um, and then looking at here is, is uh, thinking about all of these inner block spaces, how they can be uh, accessible outdoor space for, for the public. Um, so looking at that is, is sort of one of those courtyard potentials there. And that's, you know, just looking at how that could be, uh, you know, three, fan, you know, three bedroom, four bedroom units um, uh, on the upper floors. Um, so sort of shifting the Boynton Yards. So this is a transformation area, you know, going back to the orange part of the, the comprehensive plan. So Boynton Yards uh, is this area sort of on the, basically uh, contained within, uh, from Webster Street to the, uh, the right of, railroad right of way, then to Medford Street, and then to the city line. Um, you know, sort of, you know, it's kind of that uh, industrial area between Cambridge, you know, sort of Cambridge, this is Cambridge Street running down along here. Um, so just to orient folks, so, so Tots of Chocolate is in that building right there. Um, and then here in, in Ariel, uh, you can see here, this is, this is where Tots of Chocolate is. Uh, this is... Uh, Where's South Street Farm? This is South Street Farm, right here. Right here and right here. So this is South Street coming through. This is Gentle Giant Movers, just in Torian and other folks. And then this is how you come out onto Webster here. So, and then here, that's just, that's Target, the back, you know, sort of the, the railroad tracks. There's the train station. So, you know, this is about 28 acres of sort of buildable area is, is what we're looking at. And there it is in plan. Now, another important piece of this is, is the existing underground utilities. Um, you know, it was sort of the growth that the, the Summer Vision has, has looked at this area uh, of, in Boynton Yards to, to create has to sort of, you know, there's a lot of work that might have to happen underground. You know, new sewer, new internet, new, uh, um, new water, all of those underground infrastructure. So that's what these dashed lines are. So that was one of the design constraints we looked at here is what, what are investments already in the street and how can we, um, you know, how can we build around that so it's easy to, to upgrade and, and replace. So this is a plan uh, that looks at sort of working with uh, those, you know, some of these streets, just to orient everyone, there's the Tots of Chocolate building. You know, keep, I keep referring to that because that's actually one of the oldest buildings in the neighborhood. It used, to, it used to sit within some of the train lines that was Boynton Yards, the train yards. Um, and it's one of those sort of heritage buildings that we organize. You know, so, that, so just to keep an eye on that building footprint, there it is again. So this is looking at, you know, there's D3. And this is a, a, you know, a, a new neighborhood street coming through Boyne Yards, and then another new neighborhood street coming through Boyne Yards. And then these are development blocks that could be um, a variety of uses. And we'll get into how, you know, where we're sort of thinking about what the, we might start in the, what we call Scenario A 
and thinking through how can we, what's the right mi mix of program for this neighborhood. But the goal here is to find, you know, to sort of hit that 2,500 jobs for Boyne Yards and, uh, and that 500 units of housing as Summer Vision has laid out for us. Uh, so this is another uh, version of that plan. Um, you know, these streets are all, you know, we, we know some cobble streets sort of underneath the asphalt. So the idea that this could all, you know, thinking about the streets as we've talked about being part of that public space network, that might be a way for this neighborhood, um, Boynton Yards, to evolve. Um, and this is a sort of center plaza here uh, with a new park. Um, now just to orient folks, this, this, this is the Tots of Chocolate building again, you know, the sort of the, I, I, there's a name for that building, I just, I, I, I can't remember it, so I apologize. But this, so these different colors are actually important for planning this neighborhood. Um, there's a lot of number, there's a, a variety of owners out there that own the property now. And we, you know, we met with a, a number of them who came in the last few days. And each color represents a, uh, a different, land ownership today. So we wanted to figure out a way that this, uh, this transformation area could occur um, with existing ownership of, of property. And, and you know, that was a sort of constraint in existing property lines. Uh, and this is a very difficult thing to do with this type of development because it's, you know, if this could happen organically um, with existing ownership today, um, it might happen sooner is, is the thought with this plan. Um, so there, you know, so there's the buildings, you know, and you can see there's, there's a new park here, and then there's a new uh, uh, plaza, you know, sort of maybe, you know, some sort of public market building or public facility, community room, community space, and then a new uh, uh, green, you know, sort of square, center green. Um, and then another entry park, pocket park here, as you come off Webster. Um, and then we're also, having talked a lot about you know, how folks get in and around the neighborhood. This is pedestrian connections over the right-of-way um, so that you have a lot more uh, walking uh, opportunities down to Cambridge Street and up to Somerville Ave. And then also a, a, a new vehicular bridge. And then we're showing this in a couple places, but this is where it would connect uh, a parking garage over into the target site. So eventually that might be redeveloped and become part of this transformation district, you know, transformation area as well. And the, part, the cars could share those parking facilities to be really efficient about how cars get in to this neighborhood. You park once and you walk. And that's the goal here is to, is to not sort of clog all of these streets up uh, with, part, with cars. Um, so this is another version of that plan, the two parallel streets here. Um, and then these are the these are how the, the new buildings might uh, be built on those blocks. And then this is an this is an early uh, iteration of that. You know, looking at how can we get more green space, and public space in um, uh, another earlier version. This is actually one that tries to use all of the existing streets where they are uh, as sort of a, a design constraint. You know, there's a few. You know, there's an existing right of way there. Um, so, and then also looking at how can we place uh, office, you know, sort of these, these larger 135, you know, so these, these bigger, taller office buildings in a location that don't, uh, that are nice neighbors to the neighborhood that don't obstruct views from, from Prospect Hill. And then also uh, provide, you know, sort of frame these new public spaces uh, in a sensitive way with light and, and views. Um, so here's another version, you know, with a, a sort of more s traditional square. Um, and this is showing a roadway connection across at this location here. This is, this is sort of the Tatsa Chaka building, and this is Webster Street here, the new green line. Any um, versions with that? We've actually, th we've talked a lot about that, and Thinking about a way where the, some of this this new green space could actually expand the farm was one thought. Um, so you know the w ones that have this is South Street. That's the farm there, currently. Um, so yes. Um, so here's another version, and these are all pinned up. We can talk this. We can talk a, a lot about these. There's subtle variations, but um, all of them tend to have an open space here 
and somewhere over here. And that was sort of an interesting way that the street grid and the sort of the new buildings uh, were showing themselves. And then also, you know, so talking about trade-offs again, let's say we want to get more open space. This is a spot to do it. So this is, this is not, it's about four acres of new open space right in the center of Boyne Yards. Um, now that you know that sort of you know looking at that you know from a fiscal impact study from from a you know a conversation about uh, goals, we might not be able to achieve the uh, housing or the job creation goals uh, with that amount of open space, or if we do, it might require a lot more height in some of these buildings. So that's a discussion we want to have, and so looking at another way to do this, this is putting so just to orient folks. So here's the green line. Here's Webster coming down. This is how you get into Boyne Yards today. This is D3. You know, and this is a new street coming through and a soccer field and another soccer field. It's kind of the sizing of those parks, you know, so you can visualize that. And then you know, this would have to be, you know, if we want to get our job goals, these would have to be fairly substantial buildings here lining this new space. Um, and this is, a, this is essentially turning that park 90 degrees. So here below, this is sort of the Cambridge line here. So this is, uh, you know, this is Webster again here. This is an entry park coming in. And then a new uh, almost four acres here again. Um, and then envisioning, you know, sort of two-sided development here. Um, you know, so some substantially large office buildings. And these were, you know, we still have to work out parking and all of the all the intricacies of that in these plans. But this was just a, a study in open space. Now, how does this all work together? Is sort of a question we started asking ourselves. Is you know, this is a diagram of block structure, you know, streets, and open spaces, you know, parks. So thinking about you know, sort of the Bow Street, you know, coming in through Bow Street, the intersection of of Webster, Somerville Ave. Um, you know, how does that become an open space? These, these inner block sort of backyard courtyards, the new expanded plaza uh, in front of SCAT, you know, another backyard courtyard, these cut throughs of the block, a new park here. And then what happened is we started to see this sort of green spine created where this new park at Prospect and Somerville Ave going up Prospect. We talked about screening the substation in green before. In the, you know, that's come up a lot as ideas we've heard from, from the community. So then you have sort of a green wall. Then you have a new park here on part of D4. And then in, in the existing street right away, with just trimming a little bit of land from both D3 and D4, uh, we get a new park there at the intersection of Webster and Prospect. So you get this kind of green spine connecting Somerville Ave over into Boyne Yards. And then thinking about you know, the new park into Boyne Yards, a new central plaza, um, and then another park here, which we ran out of green marker over on this side. So, so and then there's more radical ideas. And you know, if cost was no factor, you know, this would be something the community could do. And that's you know, sort of the, you know, we've all heard about the high line. Well, this might be the sort of union line. It's sort of, you know, capping uh, from Prospect Street over to Medford Street, uh, the railroad right, right away. And this would be a way to build a linear park, um, which is about, about five acres, four and a half acres, from the new train station all the way along the edge of Boyne Yards, the Transformation District, and then to Medford Street um, as, a, as a new sort of green spine connecting these two neighborhoods. You know, the Boyne Yard sort of transformation area and sort of the Union Square. Um, so this is where I'm going to hand it off to Jason, our transportation uh, team leader. I'm going to walk through some numbers and ideas really fast here because I know it's getting late. And I think the punchline of me moving fast is because I think there's some really good news about transportation. And this pie chart starts to summarize that. The pie on the left is how people in Union Square today travel, the folks who live here. And this big wedge of drive alone is only 39%. There's tons of transit, tons of walking and biking. Our problem is the wedge in the right. 
there's a great solution to come up because right now everybody who comes into Union Square is driving it. We want to change that, and this is the perfect place to be changing that. The uses that exist now and the type of programs we're talking about for all these spaces are the perfect kind of mix to capture trips internally, to be creating a place that is all about living and working right here in Union Square. And that's the kind of district that I can see evolving, and it's not just Union Square specific. If you start to look at the region, and you look at the, the place that Union Square and maybe what Boynton Yards becomes as a downtown Somerville is in the broader region, this is a region of spaces and places and mixed uses that are all working similarly for the same kind of live, work, walk, bike kind of environment. And we really want to make Union Square important and more of a place on the map of trains and, and roadways. But there's a problem. There's one circulation problem that we have to continue to fight. And that is the basic issue with the roadway networks. We've got 93, we've got the parkways and the interstate on the south. And this has always been a cross-cutting move. Prospect through Washington to connect between 28 and other places down into Cambridge has always been the problem of Union Square. Not to mention the rail lines limit the number of crossings you can get. They funnel traffic, as you know, through Union Square. And the changes that the McGrath grounding will represent are just part of the bigger solutions that can really make things happen wonderfully. You know, they're talking about this addition of a, a left turn onto Somerville Ave soon as part of a, a new type of connectivity. But connectivity in general, as we think about the highway becoming a boulevard, is going to be a big part of changing the place. All of these one ways that exist are problematic because the one ways contribute to making vehicles move more quickly through Union Square. And part of what we want to do to make it a more productive place is not make people move through more quickly, make them slow, make them have different options, make them sense that this is a place to walk and to visit. So all of these one way streets we're starting to revisit. You've already seen the idea of two ways. It's already been demonstrated a year ago in detailed analysis that you can make Somerville Ave. Webster, Prospect, all work two-way very successfully. This is the stuff that we've got to end. Once you start doing the two-way system, this is a, just an arrow representing all that movement of people coming up Prospect Street and cutting through your square, and then the return move, which is the other way, which zigzags everybody right through the heart. The two-way system eliminates all of this traffic, and also by making a place that's walkable, that is a destination, no longer does Somerville Ave have to be the through way to get past Union Square. It's actually now going to be the place that people may want to be in more and need to come here by other modes. So the McGrath Boulevard, and you saw this cross section earlier, um, is really important. And I just want to touch on not so much what it is to move along it, which is wonderful. It's also the ability to get across this significantly change the character by putting it at the ground, by connecting communities and places and spaces, and that's what we want because then that makes somebody living over here able to work over here or to shop over here or to do different things across this street because it's the space that matters. I'm gonna drill down in a few little places, gonna move still quickly here so we can get through this all. This is a slight advancement over what are some of the interim options that are being considered for the square, which basically says, okay, we can get rid of very successfully the slip lane in front of the reliable market and tame Somerville Ave as a two-way street into Washington. I think this is a great place-making move. It's part of that open space gesture. We actually realize that we can go a little bit further. We realize that, and you saw Russ presenting this earlier, that reconnecting Somerville Ave as the classic main street is really possibly very fundamental to making not only this work very well, but also creating those spaces, creating a nice entry to Bow Street and making that a shared street. And I think I've got some funky little video here if I can get this working right. Uh, there it goes. So, you know, this is something that the, the, the our traffic engineers have been able to, to model. I don't know if this video is going to actually work for us. Woo, come on, video, play. It says it's playing, but it's not. There it goes. Um, so you can make Somerville Avenue work as a two-lane street. This is a big deal in the core of the square. I mean, this is an environment that doesn't need to have 
all of those lanes today because guess what they're doing? They're acting as storage for this big movement that's no longer going to be happening because we're dispersing it. So you can shrink the size of the street down to these two lanes. It all works successfully. There's no massive queues backing up. It's actually a better situation by going to the two-way. Yes. That it would what? Yes. I'm, t I'm telling you that just, I'm just telling you that two-way traffic is the way, and I'll just back up without animating it, two-way traffic is a way to better let people drive to where they want to go, but also helps to do two important things. Disperse trips instead of forcing everybody through in a one-way corridor so they can take different roads, but also to calm it all down. When you've got opposing friction on a street, you always drive slower. By dispersing the trips, I can make the roads narrower. They don't have to be a pair of big pipes. They can be a couple completely displaced two-way streets, Prospect and Webster. And by doing that, now I have got much more normal, rationalized intersections, typical normal four-way intersections, which, as weird as that one looks, that functions just that way, too. And that's what it is. It's about making a place and a space that works very well. We've thought a lot about how that works for the pedestrians, how that might work for bicycles, I'll get to the bicycle network a little bit more briefly, but how you can get through on an actual sort of off-road cycle track system, a two-way system on many of these streets. And we're also looking at other gateways, not just the core intersection. This is coming across the bridge. This is Prospect and Webster. And we could do some incremental changes that make this work a little bit better. There's would be the T station right there, as Russ was talking about. But this is that square about idea that he threw out there as well. And we are looking at this in detail, but the point that he made is that something like this can operate as a one-way square about without a signal at all. Now, one of the problems of the roundabout is that roundabouts kind of displace things and keep cars going at a decent pace. A square about really slows them down and has rationalized normal crossings and yielding patterns to get people walking to and from the station safely without any signal delay while still being able to accommodate cars and, of course, creating a gateway as you come in. And in terms of gateways, we should think about this even on the streets, for instance, Washington coming into the square from Harvard, that aren't, aren't going to necessarily have massive changes. Bringing in bicycle infrastructure, changing the environment as you approach the square is really important about changing the place, about changing that space, accommodating pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit riders is huge here. We've talked a lot about what might be some of the on-street networks and making sure that we have, again, maybe some form of a cycle track, as I said, on Somerville Avenue, not in, not in bike lanes in the street anymore. It's up on the sidewalk level that goes through the entire square. Um, need to think very clearly about the fact that now that you can make that left off of the McGrath Boulevard and there's other connections through that Washington Street on this side of the square doesn't need to be four lanes or two plus lanes. It can actually be a smaller street with more great quality biking infrastructure to get all the way to Charlestown as well as to the other T station. And then maybe even an off street network that could supplant this, as Russ was just talking recently, but maybe the Fitchburg line is actually another multi-use path because it's really important to think about the community path coming in. Maybe the Fitchburg path, certainly the, I'm sorry, this is actually McGrath Boulevard itself. The community path would be coming in over here. But we've got to think about the Grand Junction, which is going to be coming up from Cambridge at some point in time. A confluence, a way to commute beyond Union Square if need be on bikes, the through traffic on two-wheeled cycles instead of in cars. And again, thinking about how we can accommodate that through the squares, part of that design is to be able to make all those crossings happen at exactly one spot makes everything very efficient, creates a bike priority. Everybody in the world is going to see bicycles crossing right there, and it's very safely accommodated in the signal cycle. Part of that is to think about re-envisioning the streets to some degree. So this is uh, Webster. 
this is a prospect, and saying, well, maybe we should think about not necessarily, as the interim guidance has said, of saying, okay, well, Webster can become two-way with a nice bike lane and, and preserve one lane of parking. Maybe we should actually say, Webster should become a bike street. It should have a full two-way on-street facility, not just some sort of one-lane bike lane, but a full two-way facility. You always want to have bike lanes in both directions in every street, and we don't necessarily need the on-street parking there. Maybe we can think about Prospect, instead of being another one-way bike lane on a two-way street, as a two-way normal street with parking on both sides. You don't lose the parking, you change the character of the street, you slow it down a lot, you have shares, you have a station access environment that's right there. Other streets should be thinking about this as well. This is a cross-section of the cycle track on Somerville Ave through the heart of the square. And again, because we dropped it down to two lanes, we added the wide sidewalk on the south side that Russ was talking about. Here's the SCAT building. Again, it's all rendering. But look at all the additional space you can make because that street is so wide today. A two-way cycle track, a buffer, all that traffic being handled in an entirely different fashion can create, again, a lot of open space that's very functional. Washington Street, here's that idea, as I said, coming again from the east, heading towards the McGrath Boulevard. We don't need all the lanes that exist today. You can have this two-way cycle track system connecting yourself all the way through to the McGrath Boulevard, beyond, if need be, up Washington into somewhere, and of course, connecting into downtown. Always in all this, we're trying to be cognizant, and we get to the final details of the right kind of designs to get bicyclists through intersections bike boxes to turn, ways to carry people through intersections and across streets to make it very clear what's happening in Somerville is real. Let's put the right facilities on the ground. Let's get the recognition and the safety that's needed for all bicyclists out there to begin to make this clearly the primary mode that it can be. Not just more and more of these wonderful things that are maintained well, but even thinking the next level and quality of on-street uh, bike parking. And then walking, of course, is fundamental. And it's, it's variable depending on what your skill set is, but you can get quite far and through much of the square to each of the train stations, both the Union Square as well as the Washington Street, in a very quick distance. We've got you know, these types, these are the walking boundaries around the Boynton Yards and around the square. And there's a lot of ability for us to be able to go and, and, and connect to some of these stations, but recognize that there's places in the development that we need to think about those penetrations, which is why we're talking about getting rid of, there's a nice fine grain block nature, but for a walker, some of these longer blocks need to be broken up. And that is why the Boynton Yard plan talks a lot about connections through here. That is why we're worried about things like uh, the target being large, and even the market basket in the fabrication district, as Russ was talking about. There today, when people are walking through the square, it's all about Webster, which is why we talked about making that a bike street, a more habitable space, because people are walking into Cambridge and back and forth. But tomorrow, these patterns will look very different. We have to accommodate pedestrians absolutely everywhere. We have to recognize that there's going to be so much more opportunity for people to get around and to and between spaces. And it's not just the network. It's not just, okay, we've got a lot of sidewalks. As we get to the mobility revolution of the future, the cars are going to be like single-seater with kind of things. We don't need all of that. And we want to think very much about how can we make every single one of these streets smaller, more livable, and with a two-way system, it can easily handle all that traffic. And finally, I want to touch on transit. So today, we rely heavily on buses in Union Square, and there's a whole bunch of that circulation going on. We're talking a lot about how can we make all of this bus activity, all of these boardings that happen at all these stops, happen in more concentrated intervals, in spaces where the buses don't have to multiply pick up and slow things down, but the speed transit as quickly as possible on all these moves, not just the Green Line, but all the other places and spaces that we are connected to. There's already good high-frequency transit going east-west, more or less, across town move. And we're thinking about how else can we also encourage the movements to get in and out of Union Square from other places and beyond, particularly thinking about Kendall Square, which the, will not be a direct connection, but is one of those special spaces in the greater region that Union Square needs to be a part of. Finally, uh, I'll talk a little bit about cars, the development scenarios that are in Summer Vision, well, as the number one scenario here. It says right up, we know if we have this mix of uses that are there, you're automatically going to be able to lop 40% 
of what is normally considered to be the industry required amount of parking off simply because somebody can live there and work there the space that somebody lived in or, or parked in when they were a resident would be taken up by a uh, office worker during the day that type of shared parking is huge scenario two is talking about the two times as many jobs adding much more commercial which has been out there on the table and that can get even less parking and in both scenarios we're at half if not more of the trips that would normally be predicted. This is really, really important. This is not even talking about people significantly shifting their modes. This is simply by the nature of the mix of uses and how trips are captured internally. We're not talking about overwhelming numbers of traffic. And we're talking about even in a conservative scenario, what I'm gonna show you here is saying that there's only like 15% of folks being captured internally. There's only 15% of people being motivated to use other modes. And the reality in terms of what the parking impact is can be pretty dramatic. Here's those numbers again. You know, if you looked at just what Summer Vision says under the base scenario, you know, we'd need 2,000 parking spaces. The way the mix is working and the, those very simple assumptions can drive that down 80% already. So we're not talking about needing to park a couple thousand cars. If we doubled the jobs, we would be talking about over 3,000 new parking spaces. The reality is that's not how the, the use curves work. That's not how shared parking works. And we can knock 1,000 or more off of that automatically before we even talk about major amounts of mode swift. So what this is leading us to is trying to figure out the parking numbers in the scenarios of all that development that you saw and to also recognize that the more and more we tame the amount of cars and the amount of traffic that are coming into the square, we should think broadly about those that remain and how we can use tools like these to begin preserving the streets around Union Square, how we can start to make the kinds of places and spaces that folks want. There's some great neighborhood greenway movement already underway in Somerville, and there's some ways of experimenting like this already in place that we can begin to start doing, and at some point in time, bring in interventions like these that are low cost to recognize that there's an existing neighborhood that already has traffic. We want to try to work collaboratively to try to make spaces better, streets slower, and much more multimodal. And sometimes all it takes is a little bit of paint. Um, and I want to just wrap up by saying, again, all that mix of uses, great stuff. It's got this unbelievable ability to reduce trips. Look at Kendall Square. Way more development than we're envisioning here. Kendall Square's traffic is declining. What's been happening here is an absolute national best practice. It's something that other places are learning from. When they try to bring in the right kinds of mix of uses in DC that predated a lot of stuff that's happened in Kendall Square recently, they overbuilt the parking by a thousand spaces. They don't know how to get rid of those parking spaces. North Station in Boston is half empty of the garage underneath there because of this kind of change in how we use parking. So we want to be very smart, and we've done a lot of studying about how we can change the future of Union Square and recognize that each and every one of these places, while incredibly unique, right here, it's Boston, also has these basic characteristics that can make it a very li rich, livable, walkable environment. I'm going back to Russ. I, I'm, I'm going to hand the mic back to Russ for a conclusion, um, a summary, and a rather creative way of looking at what might happen if we put a whole bunch of stuff together. Um, but before I do that, I want to acknowledge that the combination of both the size of production of what has been created over the last three days, um, both in terms of what it took to put it together and put it on the boards, and what it took to put it together and put it into a, a relatively um, extensive presentation, has uh, definitely made the evening late. So I want to give Russ a chance to spend the next uh, few minutes providing a summary of one example of what might happen if we put the D blocks and Boynton Yards all together and see if we get the jobs creation and the kind of in, in, in intensity of, of, of activity while still preserving our square that we, we've talked about through these meetings. Um, but before I do that, I want to make a general announcement on what I, I suggest we do next. Um, We'll stay here for a while after you're done. We'll stay here for an hour after we're done if you guys want to, want to, if you are late night people like me and want to fill out forms and, and do that. But I understand a lot of people are not. And through it, but we're, we're getting late. So I want to respect the time. Carson has offered to, to go through it. So let me take you through what scenario A is. 
So that's A, meaning there could be a B and a C and a D. There will be a B and yeah, a B. so this is. So, so this is scenario A, and this was kind of you know guided by summer vision as sort of our baseline, and then from a lot of the urban design work that we've done over the last few days. Um, so as you can see here, uh, this is both scenario A is all of the development parcels, and the transformation area, which is Boyne Yards. So we you know, kind of think of that as the the. This is probably uh, a thirty-year build out. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, so you can see here, you know, from one of the some of the the, the slides that Jason showed, you know, uh, the parking might be uh, might be about right or might be low. Uh, you can look at the amount of office, lab, you know, maker space, hotel, civic space. Uh, we've been trying to work on how to get that number up higher. Um, so these are all related. So the, again, we've got these pinned up, so you can take a look at this in more detail. But um, this is existing today. You know, just there, there's the sort of big target building. This is uh, Webster Street coming in. This is Prospect Street coming in. Here is D2 and D3, uh, and this is a, a process model. So um, this is this is scenario A. Um, this is D3. D2, uh, office is this blue, sort of green-blue, and you can see here the sort of office coming through into Boyne Yards, and then office, uh, the sort of family affordable residential we talked about over here. We've also looked at uh, office on D1, uh, and then we've got retail in red, and then residential is the, are these lower rise orange bars. And then, and then this is D2, D3, the sort of gateway moment, you know, the sort of green spine we talked about um, uh, between those two parcels. So here's an interesting thought, though, is, you know, with this kind of um, uh, opportunity here adjacent to Union Square, it requires some regional thinking. And this is a neighborhood plan, but we really wanted to zoom out to make this point that this is a much more important uh, discussion that affects uh, the larger region, and there's some opportunities here. So this is the MBTA map, you know, the red line, the green line, we talk about that a lot. But this could be the MBTA map if, if we start to think about down to, you know, sort of Union Square, Boyne Yards, you know, this, uh, this you know, area of Somerville differently. Now what's happening here is, is, uh, is complex to explain in just two slides. But it's essentially we can expand the subway system on existing rail lines. There's existing right of way called the Grand Junction that goes into Alston, across the BU Bridge, through MIT, uh, through Kendall Square, right into uh, the edge of Medford Street, and then it heads up, uh, can head up existing right of way into Assembly Square and off into Everett. And uh, our team was doing some research, and, and there's, there might actually be a, a connection on the blue line um, that is, needs further exploration. The other thing we're showing here is Union Square, the, the green line actually extending down into Porter, so that you actually think of Union Square as a transit hub now. It actually has a fairly, uh, fairly dense uh, uh, transit connection where you have a, a transfer and a, and a transfer. So you could get to the orange line, and you can get over into uh, Alston, Brighton, you know, and back into Back Bay uh, fairly quickly. So this is the kind of regional infrastructure that's kind of hidden behind a lot of the buildings in and around Union Square right now. So what does that look like kind of in the geography of, of Somerville and, and sort of the region? So, so there's Union Square. You know, the sort of the, the sort of bow tie, bow street. You know, sort of. There's the green line stop that's coming online here in a few years, Union Square. So if you see what happens here, you've got you know this Grand Junction line, the yellow line, and then you've got the extension of the green line. You start to think about this is Interbelt and Bo Brick Bottom, and Boyne Yards. You, know, you start to think about Union Square as being you know a neighborhood center close to what downtown could be downtown Somerville in 30 years. So, you know, that that has a lot of implications on how jobs are attracted here, how 
how business owners and CEOs of corporations and, and, and labs and maker spaces and all the decisions that go into where do I locate in, in, in the Boston metro region start to get really compelling when you start to think about how all this comes together here. Um, so that was a fairly regional sort of, sort of light bulb for us in this process. And I wanted to share it with you because it, it kind of changed the way I thought about Union Square and, and, and all of the sort of transformation it, uh, areas uh, that, the, that Summer Vision has identified. So the scenarios. So we've, we've sort of assigned program to each development block as a starting point for scenario A. So each of these will be posted on the boards, let's go online, all that good stuff. Um, and then, you know, what does that massing feel like? So D1, you know, this massing is what this program pr produces. You know, so there's 162,000 square feet of office and lab, hotel, and there's office, and there's lab, and there's hotel. These are residential, sort of stepping down to the neighborhood here. This is a new park on the corner. This is Somerville Ave. This is retail on the corner. This is more residential below here with a new street cutting through D1, um, sort of a new neighborhood street. Uh, so this is a, a small park here. So on the corner here, we have a, a neighborhood pocket park that we've created. Um, and in this, so in D2, a few of these uh, have some civic space we'll point out. So 25,000 square feet of, of civic space in D2. 130,000 square feet of lab. Um, you know, so we try, that was the program we created, you know, sort of looking at the fiscal impact study and sort of a starting point for us. You know, and the, the design, we could only really get about 100 square, 100,000 square feet in. And that's an office building um, on the corner of Somerville Ave and Prospect Street. And then this is a new uh, sort of public plaza, uh, civic space here, public space, and sort of a, you know, and then this is a residential low rise and a residential high rise. Um, so this is steel construction, this is wood construction. This is retail coming into the station entrance. And then this is also a sort of linear plaza, thinking a lot about how Bow Street is sort of one of those, could evolve into a linear space. This is another one of those linear spaces coming into uh, the lower entrance to the Green Line stop. Um, and there's some really interesting things that could happen from a programming standpoint, amphitheater, sort of these grand steps there. So you see here coming down Prospect, this is an office building and an office building on D3. Phased in, this is phase one, phase two. This is the retail turning the corner and then here's a new, a new park that the retail can open up onto. And then here's a low rise residential building that meets the neighborhood. So D4, um, you know, has an interesting program. It's an expansion of, of the existing use. Um, and there's also an alternative uh, for residential and retail. But this is, you know, this was a very interesting idea that I saw that, that excuse me, D4. Uh, so this is, yes, yeah, so this is, so D4 is, this is D4, the residential building. Here's the new park at the corner of Webster, Prospect and Webster. This is D3 here and D2. Um, so here's, here's the, we don't, we don't have the massing for D2. I think it's printed though. Uh, for this uh, D4, the other D4 parcel, um, the small sort of crossfit parcel. Um, also, this triangle is, is thought of as a park. So the civic space, that's not colored green there. Um, so D5, uh, there's the program for that. Uh, so D5 is, is this cluster, you know, uh, which the, the post office is excluded in those numbers, I believe. You know, here's sort of retail and then sort of a, uh, a, a residential scale mixed use building. Um, here's D6. And that's just, you know, the office number. This was a primarily a commercial upper floor building. Here's, this, here's Somerville Ave. Here's the plaza. Retail office building, a smaller office building here stepping down to the, uh, to the existing uh, buildings. 
And then this center block connection, uh, retail lining both. And then here's the other, here's sort of the, the CrossFit building sort of uh, elevated as a sort of a flat iron building, a sort of triangle building there on the corner, um, which could be super cool. Uh, so then D7, uh, D7 is on Bow Street, sort of the gateway to Bow Street, and sort of the turning the corner up to the residential neighborhood. So this is showing a, a, a fairly uh, hefty residential program. These are sort of uh, apartment buildings, you know, thinking that this is a, a place for a, a, a nice, affordable, family-oriented project. Here's the green space, these sort of connections, uh, inner block green space connections. And we also kind of envision that maybe going through the building uh, as sort of a... Uh, a green uh, courtyard. Um, and then we're also showing, you know, there's some single story buildings. Historically, that building was four stories. So we're showing that kind of going back to four stories. Um, and then the same with this building here. Um, so and then, and then into Boyne Yards. So this is where, uh, you know, the comprehensive plan says this is a transformation area. So we've looked at, you know, it's about a, a million and a half square feet. Um, We've tried to you know hit those targets. You know, Summer Visions talks about 500 units. You know, we're we're not quite there. Uh, the office, you know, we can do some math to figure out you know sort of the spectrum of sort of jobs that could create uh, for you here this this next week. Um, but so so you know, Boyne Yards sort of is in this area, and it's interesting that we kind of have this sort of office. Uh, uh, pro, you know, the sort of clustering that's happening here around this new public space. This is that existing, you know, sort of a, a heritage, a very uh, character contributing building that we want to uh, make sure we celebrate there. So this new public space kind of organizes um, all of these, these new uh, commercial structures around. And that's the plan, just to remind folks, there's that, that new central park uh, for Boyne Yards uh, with the offices organized around it. And then the other part, small sort of park, and this is envisioned as sort of a, you know, a, a, a maker barn or a maker shed or a fabrication, like thinking about how can we deliver new space for that type of use economically. And we thought, you know, it might actually be part of the park redevelopment. And this is actually, uh, you know, f a fairly contaminated site, the soils here we heard in our research. So that we think that, you know, that could be an interesting conglomeration of uses. Um, so that, you know, that's sort of Boyne Yards. And then this is sort of our final image here of Boyne Yards. This is sort of the commercial office, sort of larger uh, floor plate buildings, research, hotel. And it's stepping down towards, the, towards Webster Street to meet the neighborhood with residential. You know, having new green space meet the neighborhood on, uh, on the uh, east side. You know, sort of going, these are the streets that go down to Cambridge Street. This is the existing neighborhood uh, that's within Boyne Yards. And then this is the retrofit of Target, you know, sort of bringing in sort of new mixed use, uh, you know, some other office coming back to the neighborhood. And here's McGrath Highway, or retrofitted as McGrath Boulevard. And then you have here the redevelopment parcels, um, D2 uh, there, the office building on D2, the residential buildings on D2, uh, a low rise and the high rise residential. That's D3. There's the train station. That's Union Square's Green Line stop. And then coming back to all of the sort of public space network in the core of Union Square. So everyone, thanks for hanging out with us tonight. This went really long, I, I know, but it's a lot of exciting stuff. We're, so there's a lot of, everything's pinned up there. So I want to, if I want to make an opportunity.
should be formatted. So we need to discuss that tonight. What will be the format of the meeting, of the, of the next meeting? Because we cannot continue like this, sitting here for three hours, listening only to you, okay. and, and then going home without raising our objections or opinions about this product. So let's open the floor for questions here, and then as part of the discussion, let's discuss the format of the next meeting that you're planning to organize. Okay. Let, let me let me let me stick it, start with a step towards the. Okay. Let me address the next meeting first, and then I will address what we do next. Um, the next meeting, which I've suggested we do eight days from now, um, in addition to having the opportunity to do drop-ins uh, separately, what I would like to do is open the building at five o'clock. Have anybody who wants to, through the course of the evening, drop in and look look at the plan boards. At 6.30, we'll meet here. I have no presentation. I have no nothing to share with you from us. We're going to listen to questions. If you want to ask what was on one of the slides, I'll have the slides here so we can go through them. If you want to ask questions about whatever, if you want to share your comments, we will stay here from 6.30 till you are done giving us your feedback on that. And, 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 and we will, I will get as many of the folks back here as I possibly can who are available that night to participate in that conversation. So that's, that's my plan for, for, for eight days from now. If, 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 if you have thoughts on that, I can take questions on that, I can take comments on that, but that's my plan for what I'd like to do next Thursday. Now, as for right now, I mean, I, 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 I'll take a poll of the audience. How many people want to stay here with us and ask us more questions? We, if, uh, just raise your hand if you do. Okay, I've got about six, so I'm going to ask the six of you to come up here and I will sit here and answer questions with you. And if other folks want to go and look at the boards or go home because it's late and you're done, that's great too. And I think that's the best way to handle the situation right now. Is everyone okay with that? All right. Thank you. <laughs>